What would you do? Let me paint a picture for your minds, ladies and gentlemen. Mexico, a country ravaged by organized crime, a nation gripped by the cartels, a place where kidnapping is so prolific that there are forms of insurance that citizens can take out specifically for paying off gangs that have taken loved ones. Can't pay, insurance not accessible, well, I think we all know what happens to those unable to foot the bill, where their loved ones end up after experiencing unimaginable torture. Whether they are actually found and placed to rest afterwards, however, certainly seems to be somewhat hopeless in many cases. Mexico's murder rates in particular between 2015 and 2017 increased considerably, with 2015 having 17, 2016 having 20, and 2017 having 26 people murdered for every 100,000 people. 2018 was actually higher at 29 per 100,000 inhabitants. Kidnapping also being particularly high during these years of 2015 to 2017 too. The South American nation of Mexico is well known on the world stage as a nation plagued by crime, more focused though and perpetuated a great deal by their cartels. The organized crime families and gangs such as the Gulf Cartels, Sinaloa Cartel, La Familia, even gangs like the infamous MS-13 who aren't Mexican, originally from El Salvador, actually formed in California, but they also operate in Mexico. Mexico is a country infamous for its cartels, narcotics, its years-long drug war, which is to alleged to have claimed the lives of over 120,000 people, 27,000 of which are still missing. It is a beautiful country, but even to this day is still plagued by corruption, high rates of murder and kidnappings, and so on. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I asked, what would you do? I ask this question in relation to the subject of this video, and I want you to keep that question in your minds as we work our way through this incredible story of one mother who, after her 20-year-old daughter went missing in 2014, embarked on a quote-unquote taken-styled mission to bring the gang members who took her daughter to justice. Miriam Elizabeth Rodriguez Martinez given the nickname of Madre Activista, Mother Activist in English. Personally, I would have called her the Mexican Iron Lady or Madam Justice or something along those lines. Anyway, my completely irrelevant desire for cool nicknames aside, Miriam was a mother scorned by the system, pushed into a corner and actively hunted down the 10-member crew of cartel members that took her daughter, taking on disguises, impersonating political figures, manipulating her appearance, even uncovering the gravesite of a massacre, and later starting an organization aimed at helping families for those who were victims of cartel kidnappings. Miriam was a woman whose awful story had been discarded and ignored by the authorities that were meant to help. So as many often do, who are pushed and pushed by the systems in place meant to ensure justice, she took matters into her own hands, and at the age of 54, she would spend the next few years investigating, tracking, and eventually apprehending 10 very dangerous cartel members. But before we walk Miriam's path and discover her story, let's talk about the place Miriam grew up in and the gang responsible, as well as some brief history. Before we can tell Miriam's story, we first have to understand a little bit about the place where she grew up. Miriam was born in 1960 in the city of San Fernando in the Mexican state of Tamaulipas. Also, apologies for any mispronunciations as I go through this, guys. The state itself has booming agricultural industries, but also possesses a growing chemical and oil production industry too. Manufacturing acrylic fibers, plastic resins, and synthetic rubbers and polymers. Its history stretches as far back as 1445, when Moctezuma 
conquered most of the land there. Tamaulipas is a beautiful state with stunning beaches and is renowned for its theatre groups. All this said, however, the state itself is also infamous for two major events. The 2010 and the 2011 San Fernando massacres, respectively. In 2010, the bodies of 14 women and 58 men were discovered in the village of El Huefetal. The bodies were found stacked up inside a ranch by the Mexican military after engaging in combat with a cartel. I believe the cartel was the Los Zetas, the group held responsible for shooting 72 migrants that they believed were going to be recruited by rival cartels in the back of the head. There were only three survivors. In 2011, Los Zetas decided to take their dealings in mass murder by kidnapping people via the carrying out of multiple bus hijackings. The women, unfortunately, were R-A-P-E-D, and the men that could were forced to fight gladiator style to the death. The aim being to recruit new members that could stand victorious in modern day horrific blood sports using hammers, machetes, and knives. The bodies were dumped in several mass graves and eventually totaled 193 corpses. Not only were 16 police officers implicated, along with one US citizen being amongst the victims, but the actual death toll is alleged to be roughly 600 people buried in mass graves throughout the municipality of San Fernando. Those two terrible events, along with continued violence between the Los Zetas cartel and rival gangs, actually caused an exodus from San Fernando. Apparently, up to 10% of the city's population packed their bags and left. To give you a brief description of Los Zetas, the cartel gang responsible for both massacres, via the SPG .faz.org website states Los Zetas. This group originally consisted of former elite Airborne Special Force members of the Mexican Army who defected to the Gulf DTO and became its hired assassins. Although Zeta members are part of the prominent transnational DTO, their main asset is not drug smuggling but organized violence. They evolved from the armed wing of the Gulf Cartel to an outfit in their own right that amassed significant power to carry out an extractive business model, thus generating revenue from crimes such as fuel theft, extortion, human smuggling, piracy, and kidnapping, which are widely seen to inflict more suffering on the Mexican public than does transnational drug trafficking. The state of Tamaulipas, through the actions of the cartels, suffered multiple assassinations of major political figures, continued and escalating levels of political and police corruption, and several prison breakouts. I'm sure after all this, I do not need to explain any further the level of fear, suspicion, and trauma the citizens of San Fernando were feeling in the early 2010s in particular. All of this compounds further by increasing kidnappings, trafficking, and murder with two warring cartels. You can see and even feel the hopelessness and outright terror and tension felt by the city's people. But now that I've painted a substantial yet horrifying picture, of the birthplace of our protagonist. Let's begin her tragic tale. Now, if everything I've just said didn't quite do the state of Tamalipus state justice in painting a grim enough picture for you, here is the 2021 travel advisory from the US Department of State Bureau of Consular Affairs telling us to not travel there due to crime and kidnappings. Anyway, on the 23rd of January 2014, Miriam's daughter Karen was driving, about to merge into traffic when two trucks filled with armed men pulled up beside her, stopped her, forced their way inside her vehicle, grabbed Karen and made off with her. The armed men transported her to the family home, wherein they placed her on the living room floor, tied her up and gagged her. Karen's uncle's mechanic knocked on the door, not knowing what was going on inside. He had arrived to do some work on the family vehicle. The kidnappers opened the door and his fate was sealed. Both were taken. Miriam had been away at the time. She worked as a nanny in the US state of Texas. Miriam requested a meeting with Los Zetas, and it seems within a time scale of a few days, Miriam had sat down with one of the kidnappers begging for her daughter's release. Naturally, and such is the nature of these cartels, they extorted money from her. 
The man that had sat with her tried to spin the narrative that it wasn't his cartel that had taken Karen and that he would assist in finding her for $2,000. Miriam paid. He left, and after a week, he would no longer answer her calls for updates. Then Miriam started receiving calls from different apparent cartel members, demanding more money. Miriam paid. Now, a bit of foreshadowing for you. The cartel member who sat with Miriam extorting two grand out of her had been wearing a radio on his belt. It had been turned on, and Miriam had taken note of a name mentioned through the radio transmissions, Sama. This would stick in Miriam's mind. After a few weeks, Miriam had moved in with her other daughter, her older daughter, Azalea, as she was already separated from her husband. Now this is the moment in the story where I once again ask you watching if this was your daughter, your son, your brother, your sister, a close family relative, or just someone you loved dearly. What would you do? Now I realize whilst asking that there is no bond quite like the bond between parent and child. Not always, but let's try to imagine being in that scenario. What would you do? And again, hold on to your answers because the lengths Miriam would go to to bring justice to those who took her daughter are truly inspiring. You'll see why I wanted to refer to her as the Mexican Iron Lady. Miriam must have been a pragmatist because after having suffered the fear and terror of being a resident of San Fernando, knowing and understanding the methods used by the cartels and knowing that it was the Los Zetas that took Karen, Miriam just knew. Waking up one morning, seemingly a changed and different woman, facing her older daughter Azalea and telling her that Karen wasn't coming back. And in that moment, she swore to hunt down the kidnappers, all 10 of them, one by one. She would have justice, she would have revenge. The city of San Fernando, at least at the time, had a population of roughly 60,000 people. If you hadn't endured any level of extortion, kidnapping, or at the least knew someone, that had been bullied, beaten, or worse by the cartels, I imagine you would be considered a rare sight indeed at this point. Now, Miriam did attempt to go about things the proper and official way. She did attempt to go through the correct channels in what was pretty much a pointless endeavor. This is San Fernando, a city pretty much controlled and run by gangsters. The police, politicians, anyone who could actually provide assistance was either in the pocket of the cartels or so overworked, understaffed, and most likely terrified to actually do their jobs. And so Miriam, like a lioness, began the hunt. And the first port of call was the mechanic that had also been taken alongside Karen. The mechanic had been freed, you see, the same day. He wasn't the intended target, and so Miriam was able to sit down with him and question him. What did you see? What did you hear? I imagine this was akin, similar to the scene in Taken when Liam Neeson tells his daughter to scream every possible detail, but obviously a lot calmer. Through the mechanic, Miriam was able to reinforce and reaffirm the existence of a gang member named Sama. Now, social media isn't always terrible. Sometimes it can be used as a tool for good. It's not all quote tweets and arguing over elections on Facebook. Miriam realized that social media is a form of what one refers to as OSINT, or open source intelligence. She would have likely deduced that surely a gangster, a member of the infamous Los Zetas, isn't going to hide themselves, surely. They wouldn't attempt to maintain anonymity. Why would they? This was Mexico. They were one of the biggest, baddest gangs around. So Miriam, via Facebook, was able to find a picture tagged with the name Sama. As it turned out, she recognized him. This was the cartel member she had met with and had subsequently been extorted by weeks prior. Slim, well-groomed, that was him. In his photo stood beside him, a woman wearing a local ice cream store's uniform, literally a couple hours away from Miriam's home. And with that information, Miriam could finally initiate her hunt. Over a period of weeks, Miriam staked out the ice cream store, making mental notes of this Leeds routine. She did this every day until one day, Summer appeared there. She tailed them as they made their way home, and now, well, now she knew where they lived. 
All this said, however, Miriam needed more. She had the address, sure, but in order to mobilize the authorities, Miriam had to acquire names. Miriam had once been a low-level employee for the health ministry. She was still in possession of her old uniform. And so with this, a fake ID, and also dyeing her hair red after cutting it, she stood looking all very official in Sama's neighborhood, carrying out a local poll, canvassing the public with smiles and official-looking paperwork. And lo and behold, she managed to get a name. Now earlier, I mentioned how Miriam struggled to, shall we say, inspire the police to do their jobs? Well, she did attempt again, and she eventually found a federal police officer with the cojones to actually listen to her. He's quoted saying this, When she pulled her files onto the table, I had never seen anything like it, said the officer who remains an active duty commander, and asked to not be quoted by name because he had not been authorized to speak publicly. The details and information gathered by this woman, working all alone, were incredible. She had gone to every single level of government and they had slammed the door in her face, he recalled. To help her hunt down the people who took her daughter, it was the greatest privilege of my career. Unfortunately, however, once the arrest warrant had been issued, Sama disappeared, for a short while anyway. After finding Sama's social media, she began tracking the other members of this small crew of kidnappers working for the cartel. On the 15th of September 2014, Mexican Independence Day celebrations were underway and Lewis, Miriam's son, managed to recognize, identify, and subsequently contact Miriam about a man, a slim, well-groomed man, who was browsing his store for headwear. It was Sama. The police were contacted and Sama was arrested. During interrogation, Sama gave up a few names and locations important to her investigation. With this, the police took the information and arrested what true crime articles refer to as the kid. Christian Gonzalez, 18 years old. Scared during interrogation, he pleaded to see his mother and whined that he was hungry. Miriam, being the empathetic mother that she was, walked into the room, handing him some food. When the officer in charge begged his pardon, Miriam retorted by stating, he's still a child, no matter what he did and I am still a mother. When I heard him just now, it was like my own child. This drops the young gang member's guard and through a simple act of kindness and motherhood, he spilled the beans. And oh my, he really let it all out. He was willing to take them to the site of the murders and burial. And so they embarked on the trip to a bullet hole ridden abandoned ranch in the middle of nowhere. Six members of the cartel had engaged in a shootout with Mexican Marines there and fatally lost the battle. What happened next is probably the most profound and memorable part of this story, at least in my head it is anyway. The abandoned ranch, an old busted tractor down a dirt path marking the site of a burial, a noose hanging nearby from a tree, a pile of victims' personal belongings, and bones. Bones of different sizes and shapes. Within the vicinity of this grim display sat a pile tossed to the side, Karen's scarf and her truck seat cushion. An analysis was carried out, a botched lazy analysis, that stated Karen was not among the deceased. Miriam had to fight them as she knew they were wrong. It would be another year before scientists were able to identify a piece of her femur, and so now Miriam was able to place her daughter, Karen, to rest. I just have to stop and say, what a tenacious iron-willed woman, if only we all possessed such incredible strength and force of will in the face of adversity. Apparently, authorities weren't the biggest fans of Miriam, and why would they be? She was forcing them to do their jobs. They try to play it off and blame her bluntness and what they describe as foul-mouthed and pugnacious, but let's be honest, being called out is never pleasant, is it? Even worse so when your pride, competence, and levels of bravery are called into question. I say bravery because I have a feeling that at least some within these various authorities that Miriam put boot to backside in her mission for vengeance and justice were probably just scared of the repercussions from the cartels, but I digress. Ladies and gents, the next part of the story occurs after Miriam leaves the ranch that day. Now, I want you to try and imagine this. You have just discovered the gruesome remains of not only your daughter, unconfirmed at the time of course, but Miriam knew 
and various other victims. You have just endured what looks like a cliche horror movie setup. The noose, dried blood stains all over the place, stacks of bones and personal belongings, including your daughter's. Bullet holes riddle the surrounding structures. It's in the middle of nowhere down a dirt path. You have just used all of your might, all of your strength and will. Try to imagine your emotions and how you would feel in this moment. Now imagine this. You begin the drive home. You pass a barbecue restaurant, which is really close to the burial site. Miriam knew this place. She had eaten there with her older daughter, Azalea, two days after Karen's kidnapping. When she had dined there two days after Karen's kidnapping, she had bumped into a young lady, one that she had known for a long time. Her name was Miss Betancourt, which I apologize again if I'm mispronouncing. She, as a child, had been abandoned by a prostitute's mother. Miriam had extended some charity and goodwill towards her by donating some of Karen's old clothes to her. On that day of stopping there to eat, Miriam had asked her whether she had heard or seen anything to do with Karen. Betancourt, not being a very good liar, played off, apparently, not knowing anything. Miriam could see through this, though, but didn't pursue questions any further. And after thinking all this, that's when the penny dropped. She knew something. She was involved somehow. Miriam thought back to the goodwill she had extended this girl and flew into a furious rage. Miriam went straight home, opening up social media once again, and lo and behold, her dread, her fear, and anger became all very justified in that moment. This young girl, this young lady, who had experienced poverty that Miriam had helped by giving her Karen's old clothes. Karen's old clothes. Karen, the daughter that had been kidnapped. There she was, in the picture, in a relationship with one of the kidnappers. This particular kidnapper was actually behind bars at the time for something else entirely. This ungrateful betrayal wouldn't go unpunished, however. Miriam staked her out. She waited for days, which turned into weeks nearby the prison where Miss Betancourt's boyfriend served, laying in wait during the prison's visiting hours for her to show up. Once she did, this was once again passed to the police. Betancourt was arrested, and after further investigation, the police realized that some of the ransom phone calls had been made from her home. After this, time flew by. Miriam continued her hunt, gathering what information she could. Some of the kidnappers were either dead or in jail. The others that were free were attempting to hide in plain sight. The kid had been arrested, Miss Betancourt dubbed the babysitter, had been arrested. Now it was time for the born-again Christian to be served some Miriam-style justice. Enrique Flores had returned to his hometown of Aldama. Before visiting him directly, Miriam paid his grandmother a visit. Miriam told her everything. Which, as a side note, kind of made me laugh a bit when I first read this. Nobody wants to be told they're a disappointment by their grandparents. You know, mother, father, I mean, maybe, but never the grandparents. <laughs> anyway, Miriam proceeded to a local church holding a service. Enrique was in attendance. Miriam contacted the police, and he was arrested right there and then in the chapel. Now, before we get to the florist, which is a really bad nickname for a supposed bad boy kidnapper cartel member, isn't it? Oh, you're infamous? Infamous for what? Flowers? Terrible legacy. Terrible. Anyway, sorry. Mrs. Rodriguez had nearly spent three years attempting to hunt down the crew of Los Zetas cartel. Leads were becoming harder and harder to sniff out. So instead of losing hope and resting, Miriam did the next best thing. She started an organization to help support families that were victims of kidnappings. The organization was called the Vanished Collective. It would later boast up to 600 members. They not only supported the families as a collective, but actively sought to work together to find missing family members. There is a bit more to her work disrupting the operations of the cartels, but we will revisit that later. Now, the florist, one of the kidnappers, had taken to selling flowers near the Texas border, and Miriam's hunt for Karen's kidnappers had become widely known. She received a tip of where he was and what he was doing. She pursued the lead, and when she arrived, he actually recognized her, choosing to run. Now, again, I ask you watching this video to imagine this scenario. Big, bad, possibly former cartel member of Los Zetas, of all gangs, selling flowers on the roadside. 
He then spots a now 56-year-old Miriam Rodriguez. Little lady, you know, hair dyed red. Should we call her the Scarlet Queen, Crimson Vengeance, the Angel of Justice? Because clearly his reaction to this was to run, and the middle-aged shadow of righteousness was now hot on his tail. The pursuit led on, but Miriam was able to catch up to him and grab him, wrestle him to the ground, and hold him at gunpoint whilst they waited for police pickup. That's the thing about Miriam Rodriguez that I just love. I really do. Through sheer force and will, she struck fear into members of one of the most notorious gangs in Mexico. There was no stone unturned, no length she would not go to in the pursuit of bringing those who had done her wrong justice. The last target, the final stakeout, was a young woman. A young woman that Miriam actually broke her foot chasing down after spending days and nights watching her home. This resulted in one, the arrest of the young woman, and two, Miriam had to wear a cast and use crutches after this due to her injury. Unfortunately, however, as one might have deduced by now, this story doesn't have a happy ending. Miriam's efforts to bring those who had kidnapped and taken the life of her daughter, coupled with her relentless, tenacious, and active leadership of an organization that not only served to support other families who were victims to the cartels, but to encourage action, the Mexican Iron Lady, the hero of San Fernando, had gained a great deal of fame inspiring others to disrupt the cartel's perceived unspoken rules of business with the citizens. Families, after all, had given in straight away to threats, paid ransom, and so on. But Miriam's actions had changed all this. She had disrupted this unnatural order. But one of the most brave, heroic, and downright toughest women of the modern centuries, even with protection, was still human. And on Mother's Day, 10th of May 2017, Miriam returned home, opening up her car door, got out, still donning her cast and crutches, when a white truck filled with prison escapees rolled up from the rear and unloaded 13 rounds, 12 of which hitting her. Her death caused massive outrage and an outpouring of support. Even the illustrious, unhelpful local government actively sought to bring her killers to justice. Only two were arrested, and the remainder of those involved, well, they remain elusive, even to this day. That's not to say that Miriam still couldn't continue her work from beyond the grave, however. A month after her death, the woman responsible for tying Karen up and torturing her was found and arrested. I assume that Miriam hadn't pursued her due to the woman being 500 miles away with her kid at the time and also being 56 in a cast and crutches isn't exactly optimal vigilante status, is it? Miriam was later buried next to her daughter Karen. Mother and daughter reunited in the afterlife, finally. Her son, Lewis, did try to continue her work, leading the organization, but it would later fall apart. No one would carry on the torch. But I do not for one second believe that any of this, despite some of the kidnappers escaping prison, despite them feeling the need to plant 12 or 13 bullets in Miriam because I guess they needed to make sure. It's kind of funny when you think about it. And despite her organization fading away and with crime rates raising not long after, I do not believe for a moment that Miriam's efforts were a waste. What she managed to achieve as a grieving mid-50s mother in one of the most dangerous places on earth is incredible. We should never doubt that. This little red-haired lady struck fear into these big hard men and women known for committing some of the worst atrocities that Mexico has ever seen. And so I ask you again, viewer, what would you do? And I have to ask other questions too. Did Miriam push too hard? Was she 100% justified in how she went about her actions? Her own son believed she pushed too hard. How would you have gone about this? What would you have done differently with the almighty power of hindsight? Let me know. You know, I usually cover and produce content surrounding internet history, archiving and logging some pretty terrible people, but Miriam was what a parent should be. A pragmatic leader, someone willing to bleed for her children. Someone who could only be stopped by being gunned down in the street in a sneak attack. She was an unstoppable force, a hard worker, a person who never once allowed her hate, anger, and vengeful rage to overtake her. 
She maintained her morals. She believed in a better Mexico, a better San Fernando, where children could grow up without fear or being kidnapped and ransomed and worse. Every time she was met with resistance, her foul mouth barked back with sarcasm and probably splashes of desperation. What she endured, the things she saw, the betrayal, the overwhelming odds against her is not something I'm able to quite quantify to you, ladies and gents. I'll admit, when I first heard about Miriam, I actually thought she had actively hunted down and taken the lives of all 10 of the kidnapping crew. And if she actually had, I'd still think as highly of her as I do now. But one does have to admire the restraint because she could have gone full Liam Neeson here. I mean, in a state of Mexico, where justice seems to be almost completely void, she probably could have admitted to it publicly and gotten away with it. Let me again try to quantify this woman's integrity and character. Her husband, after losing Karen, faded away as a person, his spirit broken, his will crushed, his sense of who he was destroyed. He became this little shadow of his former self. Miriam didn't, but also didn't have him to back her up on any level. She instead marched forward taking what support from friends and her remaining son and daughter that she could. She gave any authority who resisted actually doing their job some major attitude and rightly so. She withstood death threats, threats towards her family. In her three-year campaign, she stopped to help others in their search. She inspired a city of people gripped by fear, caused by the total disregard of human life in the pursuit of wealth. Miriam once said, I don't care if they kill me. I died the day they killed my daughter. I want to end this. I'm going to take out the people who hurt my daughter, and they can do whatever they want to me. Beneath her painted nails, red hair dye, and nice clothes was a fierce tiger, the personification of strength, what a parent should be. And I am sad to say that Mexico still has a great many problems caused by the cartel. Drugs, kidnapping, trafficking. The San Fernando Massacre of 2010, families still don't have any real answers or justice. But I'm not here to talk about how one would resolve any of these problems. The scope far outweighs my capacity as a person. I don't know how one wrestles the grip held by the cartels, but perhaps one day, 100, 1,000, maybe even 10,000 Miriams will march against these people so that a beautiful, stunning and wonderful land like Mexico can flourish once again. Thank you very much for listening to this video. Peace.